Good evening and welcome to the Family Theater for this evening's Millennium Stage presentation brought to you by the Centene Charitable Foundation with major support provided by Target and the Marriott Foundation. As a courtesy to this evening's artists and other audience members, we ask that you silence your mobile devices at this time. There is no photo or video permitted. Every day, the Millennium Stage celebrates the human spirit by presenting a free performance at 6 p.m. 365 days a year. All of our performances are broadcast live and available for on-demand viewing at www.kennedy-center.org, as well as on our Facebook page and YouTube channel to make the arts as accessible as possible. Tonight's performance is the last in a special brand new series called Library X Breach, LGBTQ plus changemakers, and it was taking place every Monday in February and presented in partnership with the Library of Congress. We at the Kennedy Center are proud to partner with the Library of Congress to educate and elevate LGBTQ plus voices at the nation's Performing Arts Center. So now please join me in welcoming Katie Klinkle, the Chief Program Administrator at the Library of Congress. Thank you guys. Uh, so first I want to thank the Kennedy Center uh, for what has been an amazing month of collaborative LGBTQ plus programming. The library is really honored to partner with such an extraordinary institution and we're really looking forward to working together with them again. For those of you who don't know, the Library of Congress also has its own series of programming with some of the nation's foremost authors. We call it National Book Festival Presents. This series an, is an outgrowth of the fan favorite National Book Festival. How many of you have been to the Nas National Book Festival? Oh, I love to see those hands. Thank you. Uh, this year is going to be our 20th year, so it's going to be our biggest and best one yet. So you can join us August 29th at the Washington Convention Center for that. Um, and you can go find out more information about that at loc.gov slash bookfest. Uh, I also have a special preview announcement for those of you here and watching at home. Um, beginning April 2nd, the library is going to be opening its doors late every single Thursday with exciting new programming, workshops, and activities. So we're extending our hours until 8 p.m. every single Thursday. So we hope you guys join us after work, come by, see the programs. They're all free, and we're calling it Live at the Library. Not live at the library, but you can do that. Um, <laughs> so we're really looking forward to that initiative. Uh, we also have a broad and deep range of LGBTQ collections. Um, it contains over 200,000 items, so I want to plug that. From the papers of uh, gay rights pioneers to the recently acquired National AIDS Memorial Quilt Archive, which is really amazing for us to acquire. Um, so we want to invite all of, all of you, including those watching from home, to come use those collections and purchase them. Among the many treasures the library has, it includes our staff. So I just want to take a moment to introduce our very first LGBTQ plus librarian, Meg Metcalf. If I can get a round of applause for Meg. So I want you to know what Meg looks like because she would love to tour you around the library or do a virtual meeting with you so you can find her after this performance and talk with her about that opportunity. And she, in partnership with the Kennedy Center, pulled this great programming together. So we're very thankful. Um, so let me introduce our panel for tonight. Uh, it's being moderated by the library's own Roswell and Cena, our chief communications officer. He's been instrumental in elevating the LGBTQ programming at the library, from hosting the cast of Queer Eye last April to helping initiate the first ever library-wide pride pop-up in 2017. Roswell is joined by Jacob Tobia, an actor, producer, and author of the national best-selling memoir, Sissy, a coming of gender story. <laughs> Fabulous. Incredible. And he's also joined by best-selling author Casey McQuiston, <laughs> author of the novel Red, White, and Royal Blue. So please welcome me in joining your panelists for tonight. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Kennedy Center tonight. And I want to thank Jacob and Casey to be here tonight, if you notice. Um, so when um, Jacob walked in earlier, he was wearing this necklace, and I just had to borrow it for tonight's <laughs> conversation. So first, um, um, I kind of wanted to get this out of the way to make sure we are respectful and we could spotlight everyone's own individuality here and talk about everyone's pronouns that are here, who are here on the stage. I and identify as a he, as a him. Mm -hmm. How about you? Uh, she, her, they, them, choose your own adventure. Uh, as we say in the South, whichever way the spirit moves you. Mm -hmm. um, they, them, she, her, if you're nasty. So both of your books have been out since last spring. 
um, it's been received with so much enthusiasm and joy, I should say. What kind of reaction have both of you received from, from your tours, from, from fans, from readers, any fun stories that you've had during your trip around the country talking about your books? Um, I, I feel like the, the strangest thing for me um, in terms of having a book out in public is like I, uh, my inbox um, has become very unpredictable in terms of what it will make me do in public um, because you'll randomly get these little like no I don't actually I don't actually get a lot of hate mail which I'm kind of like why like ex <laughs> like like I'm talking about all this I don't know anyway I'm like I'm kind of fascinated by that I'm like when does that start like some of my friends get so much more than I do but I just get like these really sweet notes from like moms or from like parents being like I read your book and it's like helping me raise my like gender nonconforming child and I'm just sort of like I'm just sitting here in the Starbucks trying to check some emails, and now I'm like, I thought that being the girl crying in a Starbucks while writing my book would end after it was finished, um, but now I'm just the girl crying reading emails from sweet moms and dads in the Starbucks. So I'm just always crying in a Starbucks now, apparently. How about you, Casey? Man, I mean, it's been amazing. Um, I think that like one of the most incredible things for me is I didn't really like I you know didn't come out until I was in my 20s. Um, and so I didn't really get to have like a queer adolescence, you know, where I was like around a bunch of other like openly queer people and like in celebration of that and like having a good fun time and not like a weird repressed time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so like going on tour has been this kind of amazing uh, opportunity to have that second adolescence, you know, and just like have fun and, and be surrounded and, and feel like loved and accepted and, and, and just having a good time, you know, and it's been amazing. Um, and yeah, and I, I've gotten all of the emails that make me cry <laughs> as well. Um, I've heard from, you know, people from like, you know, I'm 85 years old and I've been living in Florida for five million years fighting for, you know, these rights and, or like teens who are 15 and just like figuring themselves out. And like, you know, the first time I, I you know, felt good about being gay was like reading your book, you know? Mm -hmm. And those kinds of things are just like the absolute coolest. It's been incredible. You brought up a good point. When I was growing up a long time ago, like um, in the early 90s especially, there was no book that I could find in the bookstore that kind of addressed um, LGBTQ characters or had anybody I could identify with and you really had to search for that book. Either you had to go to the gay section of the bookstore, which was really buried in, um, in Barnes and Nobles, and other bookstores in the past, or you had to go to a gay bookstore to find something. And back then it was not even so mainstream and it was a big production. Um, so I finally found a book. Um, I remember being it such a big deal. It was called The Best Little Boy in the World by Andrew Tobias. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, here, here I am. And it's finally somebody who's addressing all the issues that I was facing. Um, 30 years later, I feel like we've turned, if you think we've turned, um, or went over a hump already that I feel like there are plenty of books now that I feel like teens or young adults or adults could um, identify with and find a book. Do you feel like we're there? With Call Me By Your Name and Love, Simon and mm. you know, um, Wyoming Stories where Brokeback Mountain was featured. Right. Um, do and, you feel and, like we're I mean, at a place? What's interesting about the books that you named um, is that they're all like white gay dudes um, who are in general represented pretty like masculine of center unless they're like totally twinked out. Um, and, and I feel like, um, you know, that's part of what, what I'm seeing in the landscape is that there are certain kinds of queer stories that are now valued and have actually, um, like I think that many industries have learned to commodify, um, but, uh, but I don't at all think we have a level playing field yet. Um, so, so in some ways, it's really wonderful that like, you know, I, I think both, both Casey and I experienced like seeing our book in very prominent places in Barnes and Noble, like in our hometown Barnes and Noble. And I grew up in, in Raleigh and Casey grew up in uh, New Orleans. <laughs> Sure. That's the that's the branding that's what we're gonna we say use. When we want me to be cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, really, should, can I out you? I mean, I grew up in Baton Rouge. The suburbs, baby. Suburb, yeah, I grew up, also, I didn't grow up in Raleigh. I grew up in Cary. It's a more boring suburb of Raleigh. So, you know, suburban trash. But I feel like um, it, we both have had sort of that experience of seeing our book in a prominent place. And that part's really cool. Um, but I, I guess when I think about publishing more generally as an industry, we're not even remotely there yet. 
um, you know, I, I, there need to be so many trans titles out in a season that people are talking about, like, debating which trans book they loved the most. Mm -hmm. um, right? Like, there need to be, um, like, I, I'm still waiting for, like, a Reese Witherspoon or an Oprah to pick a trans or queer title for their book club. Yeah. Um, I'm like, why has that not happened yet in a major way? Like, it needs to happen now, like, 2020 this year immediately. Like, it's actually inexcusable to, like, not do more of that. Um, and, and, and more generally, I think that consumers have to learn um, to value queer and trans stories more, and, and that requires publishing to stop thinking of us in a tokenized way and to start thinking of us as storytellers that are just excellent. You know what I mean? Yeah, when I think, uh, yes. Please clap for that, it was amazing. If you want. Crushed it. Uh, but I, and I also think that, um, you know, it's not really enough to just have, you know, like you said, like, you know, a couple titles on the shelf each season. Um, it's also about like having the people behind the scenes um, being like queer and trans people, queer and trans people of color especially, um, who are, you know, involved in these books every step of the way and they're involved in every part of the industry. Um, and, and they're, you know, everything is, is touched and, and filtered through a million different queer lenses, I think right. is really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, uh, you know, there's there's so many queer experiences and nobody right. has the monopoly on like what is the quintessential queer experience. Um, and so, yeah, it's like you said, like I want the, I want to be like, like I don't have time to read all the queer books, you right. know? Like I want it to be, I want to be like spoiled for choice. Mm. Um, and I, I think that we're not there yet until I'm like, oh, another gay vampire book. Like, <laughs> like I'm not going to be satisfied. <laughs> I do feel like there's such a big shortage of lesbian books or queer books, mm. or and we're not talking about that. As you mentioned, they're all right. white guys coming out, and I feel like there's a big part of the community that's not being addressed and still mm. can't find a book that they could find in a mainstream bookstore. Mm. Yeah, I, I also feel like you know I've learned. Um, so much more about publishing through the work, specifically right now, of like Latinx organizers around American Dirt. Have y'all all sort of know this backstory? Yeah, so American Dirt, it's a book written by a white lady about um, like crossing the border. <laughs> with like what I'm told is some pretty bad Spanish. Um, and, and I feel like that, that story has been really interesting for me because I, I think I did not learn how to really connect with sort of my frustration with publishing that I don't get queer and trans people looking over my work, that I don't have like Arab American editors looking at my work, right? That I have to hire so many sensitivity readers to make sure that I'm not putting my foot in my mouth and to make sure that I'm actually like making work that calls people in. Um, and, and I, and I, I, yeah, I feel like I'm, I've connected through kind of the organizing around American Dirt um, and around what Latinx voices are saying about it um, so much more with uh, what, what I feel we deserve, right? Which is a publishing industry that actually, like the big five, right? Like the big five publishers that actually care about diversity internally and care about hiring editors um, and that, that reflect the world around them and hiring authors to tell stories that are theirs to tell. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I think that, like, every day I see people saying, like, well, like, these books just don't exist. And I don't think it's that the authors writing them don't exist. I don't think it's that the stories aren't being written. I think it's more just about um, the risks that need to be taken about investing in, in these right. books, you know, and, and putting, like, like, the power and money behind them. Because there's so many people out there that have incredible stories to tell, that have incredible voices that, you know, need just the amplification to right. reach the people. And there are, I mean, there, there's, I think if like, like we're sitting here at the Kennedy Center proves anything, it's that there is a market for like queer books, you know, so. Not to pull more on this thread. Um, <laughs> Alan Hollingshurst, he's a best-selling novel and he won the Booker Prize a couple of years ago. And he made this big announcement and he, when he was being interviewed by The Guardian that uh, the gay novel is dead. As you can imagine, there was a big backlash among LGBTQ plus authors that the story needs to be told. How do you guys feel about that? Do you think the gay novel or the gay nonfiction book is dead or do you feel like books by gay authors with gay characters should just be listed under nonfiction and fiction instead of gay fiction and gay erotica? It should just be listed along with the rest of the other books. 
I mean, we kind of had this conversation just now in the dressing room. Um, we have a dressing room here. It's really cool. It's, you know, the lighting <laughs> is very dramatic in there. We've got like some ring lights around the mirrors. Mm -hmm. They were like switching off some of the lights so we could have a little more um, contrast. And there the was shadows. some fluorescent as well as sort yeah. of the makeup lights. And I was like, let's just have the makeup lights because like we don't need fluorescence right now. It was honestly, it was like a whole vibe back there. It was um, very moody. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. Um, you know, it's like we were both saying that we're kind of of two minds about this, which is on the one hand, I think it's really incredible to like walk into a bookstore and like walk into the queer section like, okay, this is where like I feel a sense of belonging, I feel safe there. But that is me as me at 29, mm -hmm. um, very comfortable in my queerness, very com like out to my family, out to the world, all of those things. But me at 17, like I have this like, very vivid memory of like, um, being approached by like a, some people from a local church when I was a teenager, like skulking around my local Barnes and Noble, being like, um, would you like to come to our youth group? And me and my friends being like, why would you ask us this? And then as they walked away, we realized we were standing in the Wiccan and occult aisle. <laughs> <laughs> Completely by accident. But, but um, you know, the thought that, you know, crosses my mind is, you know, if I was that 17 year old teenager and I was standing and like under a sign that said queer fiction, would I feel like there was a target on my chest? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a little scary to me, and that's why I understand, like, you know, it's, there's, there's, it's, it's difficult, you know, like, do you want to have that, like, like, it's the same thing what we were talking about with covers, where it's like, um, would a queer person who's closeted feel safe holding my book on the train, right. you know, or in front of their parents, yeah. you know, um, but also at the same time, like, uh, you know, um, I'm, my book usually, for the most part, gets shelved amongst all the other romance. Like, there's like, a, like probably 25 other like cute, uh, illustrated, colorful um, romance novel, like rom-com novels out there right now that my book gets shelved alongside, which is incredible and, and um, makes me really happy. And I think it goes a long way towards normalizing like queer love stories, which is a big part of my objective with writing this book in the first place, because I'm a huge rom-com fan and I wanted uh, something that felt like every other rom-com I'd ever read, but like I felt myself reflected in. I should say though, I really wanted to live in this alternate universe <laughs> that you created with Thank that you. president and with this um, love story happening between Buckingham Palace and the White House. <laughs> but but yeah, so like it's hard. I don't think queer is a genre. I think like that's what we're getting at with like wanting there to be more queer books. Is that like there's so many queer books across every genre that it's just like well we just have to shelve this because mm -hmm. like this is a story just like everything else is a story. Right, and, and the thing that I, that I do get frustrated about um, in, in regards to kind of how queer and trans work is digested in public um, is that there, I, I don't feel uh, that in general, like it, at least I don't feel like Sissy has gotten a fair critical analysis because when people review it or when people talk about it, they're talking about, they're talking about it as a representational piece of work, not as a piece of craft, if that makes sense. Um, and and, and it's frustrating to me because I put so much attention, time, and spiritual work into the craft of the thing, right? Like for me, and I don't know how this experience was for you, but I had to really, it's probably different too because of the like memoir versus nonfiction. Sure. Um, I mean, memoir versus like, like hot romance. <laughs> Can we talk about how steamy Red, White, and Royal Blue is? <laughs> No, but just, I, you know, like, <laughs> truly, like, I need a warning on it. You know what I mean? Because th that cover, like, I don't see that cover and think, like, there's going to be some lewdness, like, real it's lewdness. It's not even that lewd. Um, okay. Uh, tell that to my imagination, A. And B, tell that to who I was sitting next to the plane on when I was coming over to D.C. Because they, I, I just, there were moments where I was like, I did not mean to moan. And here I am on that plane, moaning. Okay, if you think that's bad, I have to write these things on the plane, so. No, that's just like hot. Um, <laughs> Casey, you, you, and Jacob brought a good point here. Um, how did you know about all this? I should say though, oh, no. part wait, wait, of this. Wait, wait, wait. I, need, I, need to, I have to circle back to my actual Let's intellectual point first. Okay, yes, yes, um, my thirst always you know, comes before my intellectual <laughs> self. I'm working on that actually. I'm really working on being like, you know, if you have to like choose between doing work and getting your work done on time or going on a good date, you go on a good date because you are in your late 20s and that's what your late 20s are for. Um, but thank, can we get a round of applause for that? Thank you very much. 
Um, but but no, the thing that I think the thing that I that I get grumpy about is like I spent so long because um, I knew I wanted to write a book for a very long time. I, and and the kind of the memoirist that I that I fetishize that I obsessed over because I grew up in Raleigh is David Sedaris. Obviously, David Sedaris is like our hometown hero, right? Like he's everywhere. He was someone I grew up reading his work. I grew up seeing play productions of Santa Land Diaries every like you know like the, he was everywhere and ubiquitous in this way. And I feel like in sort of the early part of when I imagined this book, I spent, because I, I came up in the movement organizing world really, I actually worked in DC for a second before I like went to New York and then did some more movement stuff there. And what I became really accustomed to is this kind of specific political messaging around identities that is about like, okay, you have to like get there very quickly. You have to prove the discrimination, prove via trauma how big everything is, why we need to change the policy and then have your triumphant conclusion about how you love yourself. Right? There's a formula that we have about how to tell stories for social change that actually often works against getting that social change because it puts us in this little box narratively of what we're allowed to say and what we're not allowed to say. And so I spent like a year or two really being like, I mean, how do I write the non-binary book? And then, I, and then the only way I got to actually writing it and writing anything worthwhile that anyone wanted to buy was when I was like, oh, like, fuck that. I don't need to write the non-binary book. I need to write one of the many non-binary books, right? I need to write a non-binary book. And more importantly, I need to write something funny. Um, and so the thing I get frustrated about, sort of apropos of this question, is like, I don't think that people look at trans or queer memoir with a critical enough lens around how the memoirist has chosen to represent things. Because my, the thing I'm most proud of about Sissy, and y'all can let me know if I'm wrong, by the way, but the thing I'm most proud of in my egocentric little vain bubble um, is I worked really hard to make it a book that like, um, that like queer and trans young folks, queer and trans people of as radical of politics as possible, like can read, love, enjoy, feel held by, but also a book that like, my, you know, my neighbor's mom could read in North Carolina and still feel like it's speaking to her. And bridging that wide of a distance with one narrative is really, really hard. And I don't feel like I've gotten anyone tap into that about like what has, like what, what went into this prose to make it do that. And those kinds of questions I think get asked of other people who aren't being tokenized so much. And so I just, I, yeah, I, I, I get frustrated around some of those pressures. I, I hate to do this sense. transition, but because we opened the door there, how do you know about all about gay sex? <laughs> all writing is research. <laughs> That's my answer. <laughs> Let's talk about coming out. Um, and I'm going to let both of you read a, a portion of your book. Wait, I, one thought about that. Sure. I was like, wait, where do you get travel sized bottles of lube? They make packets. I was like, I, I mean, you know the packets, but I was like, I didn't know a travel size bottle, like a little three ounce bottle. I was like, I didn't, I just clearly need to do more research myself. You need a better CVS. I... <laughs> All right, let's talk about coming out. So both of your books handled coming out in maybe non-traditional ways that books kind of illustrate. Um, Jacob, I'll let you read your part and you have a nice perspective of coming out. Oh, and actually it's very, it's very related to our conversation. There's a little shout out to Lube in it. <laughs> no, there is. Wait, one second. Okay, so I'm reading from, if you have a book, you can read along. Don't worry about it if you don't. Um, but I'm reading from chapter four called A Very Dramatic First Coming Out. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how long I'm going to read for. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. For queer and trans people, life in the closet can be nasty business. It's not just the experience of withholding your identity from people you love, living a half-truth while you navigate the world as someone else that is traumatic. It's also the way we talk about that period of our lives, the limiting metaphors we use to structure our self-knowledge. As a kid, I didn't pause for a moment to think about whether the metaphor of, quote, the closet worked for me. I took the closet as a shameful, foregranted part of my epistemological reality. But what's obvious to me now, as an adult, is that this metaphor doesn't allow young queer people to have empathy for ourselves when we aren't yet ready to proclaim our identities to the world. I've come to loathe the idea of coming out of the closet. There's something about its black or white, in or out nature that rubs me the wrong way. Thanks to many queer theory classes in college and the brilliant work of writers like Eve Sedgwick, I'm starting to imagine other narrative possibilities. Instead of the closet, I'd like to propose a more humane metaphor. What if we talk about queer and trans people coming out of our shells? When you think about it, us queers are a lot like garden snails anyway. We love flowers. We have beautiful, curly shells. 
We are slimy and understand the power of proper lubrication. <laughs> we leave a shiny, glittering trail wherever we go. And you, did you know that most snails are gender neutral and play both male and female roles in procreation? That many snails change gender multiple times throughout the course of their lives? More important, when you fuck with the snail, when you make it feel like it's in danger, it'll go right back into its shell. It will protect itself. You'll no longer be able to see its gorgeous, glistening, alien-like body, only a hard shell of its former self. When a person hides in the closet, we act as if it is their responsibility to come out. But when a snail hides in its shell, we don't delegate responsibility the same way. A snail only hides in its shell because the world outside feels hostile. If a snail recoils at the sight of you, it's not because the snail is cowardly or lying or deviant or withholding, it's because you've scared it. When queer people hide our identities, it's not because we are cowardly or lying or deviant or withholding, it's because the world and people around us felt predatory, because someone scared us intentionally or unintentionally, and we were trying to protect ourselves. Like snails, we too are defensive. Um, and I'll end for that for brevity, but it goes on a little bit more about other stuff. What was your thinking process when you made the, I guess, the parallels of coming out of the shell instead of coming out of the closet? Um, I mean, I, I've been grumpy about the idea of the closet for quite some time because it just, um, it doesn't represent my queer experience really in any way, um, except for the very, very early days of it, right? Like when I came out, um, I came out as gay first, and I did that like super by the book. Like I did the like Degrassi version, you know what I mean? Um, I did the like sit mom and dad down, like try to get them in the same room. Why are they not gonna be in the same room? Do I have to ask them to get in the same room and alert them something's coming? Okay, I guess I have to do that because I've been running up and down the stairs for an hour. Anyway, mom and dad, I'm gay. And then like, you know, conversations, just a little bit of drama, told some other people, you know, like did the whole like disclosure thingy. Um, and, and then with my gender, I just, I never came out, folks. People like will interview me and stuff and they'll be like, so like when did you come out as genderqueer? And I'm like, well, by the time I used that language, it was highly redundant. Um, <laughs> like, like, I mean, maybe I would have like, I mean, can you imagine like if I'm just sort of like coming downstairs for dinner? <laughs> You know, I'm just, oh, there's the table. We have some spaghetti, you know. <laughs> and then I sit down wearing this and say, Mom, Dad, I have to tell you something. <laughs> I'm genderqueer. And they'll be like, no shit, Sherlock. You're wearing <laughs> lipstick, right? So, so there's this way in which um, the, the idea of disclosing my gender verbally as an identity um, doesn't track at all. It was always about having the courage to wear the thing. And that's a daily ritual for me, like having the courage to step out of my room or like to get out of a car or like today when I needed to take Instagram pictures by the Lincoln Memorial and had to get out and confront all the middle schoolers wearing this. Um, <laughs> like, the, you know, there's these moments, but it's not this one grand gesture and it's not verbal. Um, and so I just, I just really, it, it feels so important to me to expand how we think about all of that. And that's another reason why I loved your book. So Casey, you approached it in a different way. Sure. I feel like both Henry and Alex came out in some different way. I guess Alex came out to himself, mm -hmm. and Henry knew he was gay. It was a matter of how to deal with it and, yeah. the, uh, and the fallout from it. I'll let you read something from your book, then we'll talk yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, OK, so this is um, going to be slightly different in tone, because again, memoir versus fiction. Um, and if you haven't read my book, I apologies, uh, spoilers. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so this is uh, just before the first kiss, and for context, at this point, um, Alex does not know that, uh, Alex is just extremely self-absorbed and does not know, has not noticed that Henry is extremely gay. Um, and, okay, so Henry bites his lip, waits a beat, and opens his mouth again. I date more, probably, as well. They're talking about what they would do if they weren't famous. <clears throat> Alex can't help laughing again. Right, because it's so hard to get a date when you're a prince. Henry cuts his eyes back down to Alex. You'd be surprised. How? You're not exactly lacking for options. Henry keeps looking at him, holding his gaze for two seconds too long. The options I'd like, he says, dragging the words out, they don't quite seem to be options at all. Alex blinks. What? <laughs> I'm saying that I have people who interest me, Henry says, turning his body toward Alex now, speaking with a fumbling pointedness as if it means something but I shouldn't pursue them, at least not in my position. Uh, so that's just kind of like Henry's 
fumbling, clumsy coming out to Alex. And then I have, uh, it's way too long to read, but basically the entire following chapter is Alex coming out to himself. Um, and I kind of, I wrote these two different, uh, like my two main characters have very different relationships with their queerness because um, I was trying to, I mean, I think there's a lot of different characters that have different relationships with their queerness in the book. Like Nora is bi and she talks about, like Alex asks like, how did you know? She's like, I don't know, I touched a boob once. It was like, whatever. Um, which is how it happens for some people, yeah. you know? Um, and, and so I kind of wanted, that's kind of what it was, comes back to what I was saying about how like there's no queer monolith, there's no singular queer experience. We all, uh, some of us know from like the moment that we have any awareness of self. And for me, it was something that was like kind of um, uh, percolating for a very, very long time, um, but because of the environment that I grew up in was something that I was like very in denial about for a very long time and it wasn't, and I think that's, this is um, really reflected in Alex's story where he's, you know, he's from the South, he's raised super Catholic, um, and he's always been like, well, I like girls, so sure, that's like, that's, that's what I need to know. Um, and, uh, and it's not until like some, you know, inciting event forces him to confront like, all of these signs he's been ignoring and pushing away his whole life that he kind of starts to come out to himself. And, I, and that's something that is, you know, very close to my own personal experience and that I wanted to show because I think um, uh, like later in life, like not that your early 20s is later in life because like, please kill me if that's true. Um, <laughs> but, but, uh, but, you know, I think that that is something that, um, it can be, it can, it can feel a little alienating um, if, if, you know, you're, ju you're, you're going through your baby queer years and other people have, you know, like they know all of the, the words and the terms and the places that they're supposed to go and you're still like baby queer, you know? Um, and so I wanted to show that, but then Henry has more of like, um, he's kind of more of an exploration of um, outness within different spheres of your life which I think is something a lot of queer people have experience with, where it's like, well, it's safe for me to be queer with my friends. It's safe for me to be openly queer around these people, um, but like maybe with my family it's not safe, or maybe at work it's not safe, or you know, it's not safe for me to like ride the subway with false eyelashes on, you know, mm -hmm. like kind of stuff like that. And, um, and, and so that's kind of what I was trying to explore with these different types of coming out. It's like, are you coming out to yourself? Are you coming out into a sphere of your life that hasn't previously been somewhere you were comfortable being out? Um, and I, you know, we all come out five million times over the course of our life when we're queer people. Uh, and, and that's kind of what I was trying to get at. What I like about both of your books, um, they're joyful. Um, you read a lot of LGBTQ+, either they're fiction or nonfiction. They always had some big drama moments. And I, I, this goes to some, to some of the, my favorite books of all time, from The Great Believers to um, Brokeback Mountain to um, um, The Immortalists. They always have some big gut punch um, turnaround that's just gonna you know, melt you to pieces. But both of your books, they stay above the fray of joy. And I feel like more books, especially with LGBTQ plus characters should have or have stories like this so it doesn't feel like it's always doom and gloom and I think both of you did a great job illustrating that was that on purpose yeah I mean for me um kind of what I said earlier you know I am like my like the root of my love of storytelling is romance rom-com um I think the first movie I remember seeing in theaters was you've got mail shout out Meg Ryan um <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I wanted, I loved those stories and I loved the escapism of it. I think that romance is one of the purest forms of escapism because it's just feelings. Mm -hmm. It's just feelings, you know? Um, and, and I wanted to have that high and have it also be something that I felt like it was people who loved the way that I loved and the way that my friends loved and the way that, you know, the people I dated loved, you know? And, um, and that was what I was kind of chasing after. But I mean, I do think that like, it's, it's, it's not even about like, we like, like, I don't think any extreme is good. Like we can't have all happy queer stories right. either because the queer experience is huge, yeah. you know? Um, and I think it's, it's great to have the range. Yeah. And I mean, you know, for me, it's like, I, I was, I was on the phone with my agent the other day doing one of those, like, um, cause I'm like developing a TV show and like developing a TV show about the sort of like auto fiction around your life is actually like emotionally hard. Um, 
like weird, you know what I mean? Like scripting something that's based on your life is like like makes you feel things. Uh, so anyway, that's strange. So I was like doing that thing where I like cry on the phone with my agent because I'm that girl now apparently. Um, and I had this moment where I was like, yeah, I mean, I was like, I was like, Val, I mean, where do you think all my funny comes from? You know, like like it, and and I think that's the thing I love about queer and trans comedy um, and humor is that it's based in the same pain, right? Like it comes from some of the same pain. Um, it's just a different way of spinning it. Um, and for me, like I, I think that the way you should write your queer tone, the way you should find your trans timbre, um, it hashtag trans timbre, <laughs> tra copyright, make whatever. it happen. Um, but I feel like the way you should find that is like is it should come to you. And like if you're, and, and this is something I think that's so important for movement building as well as for literature is like, it's not like we need, we need all of the shades of voices, right? If you just want to like get on the page and scream for 375 pages, I will watch you yell the entire time and I cannot wait, right? If you want to like cry the entire time you're with the way through what you're writing, like I want to be there with that. If you want to giggle and like make me pee my pants a little bit laughing on a plane, like I want that too. Um, and I think it's just so important to not fight your own current um, in terms of how you're authentically relating to what's going on in your life right now. Because queer rage is beautiful, trans rage is beautiful, queer giggles are beautiful, trans giggles are beautiful. Like, and, and there's no, you don't have to choose between them. Um, and that's what was so fun about writing Sissy for me is that the reason I was able to find healing in the process of writing it is that I made a commitment to myself that I would not tell any story in the book without finding the joke like without finding how the setup was funny or what was going on that was so weird. Um, and it was fun because by the end, there were stories in my life that had been such sources of trauma and darkness that ended up having three layers of comedy that I hadn't seen until I revisited them. A great example, um, my college graduation, I wore this kind of Jackie Kennedy but slutty number. Um, <laughs> I was in the era of my life where I like was just trying out dresses and skirts and I didn't understand them geometrically. Um, like I didn't get the like, oh you stand up and you try it on in the mirror and like, it's short but fine and you sit down and you're like, why is it so much shorter? Um, I didn't know how that worked, so I was wore this thing and just like, thank God I had a graduation robe because otherwise I could not have sat down all of graduation weekend. And you know, my dad came to my graduation because parents, um, and he was not too pleased about it and we had some words. Um, and that story was so dark for so many years of my life because it was this moment of my father rejecting me and blah, 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 blah. And then my brother pointed out, like, isn't it funny that your dad referred to your femininity for a, a significant period of your life as that San Francisco shit? And then also took you and the family on a trip to San Francisco literally the week after for your graduation trip. Like, like, isn't that funny? And I was like, dude, that's so funny. And so, you know, now when I think about graduation weekend, I think about all the hilarity in it and I, and I rewrote it as a comedy, as like a dark comedy in my head and it feels so much lighter. Um, God, it feels so much lighter. So like, I think, I think there's such a value and transformational power in humor and it's also a way to sort of like you know, when you laugh at the people who are oppressing you and like tell that because they are so ridiculous for trying, I mean, that is a very powerful position <laughs> yeah. to, to come from in the world. Mm -hmm. um, there's one um, common thread in your book too. It's the location of both books. You have, an, of course, yours is set in the White House, which is obvious. You have a nice visit to the White House and um, I'm running a little bit out of time, but I'll let you read a little bit of it because it's quite funny. Okay, I'll read a very, very, very quick little bit. <laughs> Um, so, okay, so spoiler alert, um, well not spoiler alert, uh, but so during the Obama years they did these, um, in June they would do an LGBT pride reception every year, and one year I got invited uh, because I was doing some organizing in North Carolina and things went really bad with this like constitutional amendment in like, 2012 and the White House felt terrible and so they invited a bunch of North Carolina people and I got to go. Um, and I was like, this is a good consolation prize actually. It's actually a really, really good one and it comes with <laughs> chic napkins. Um, I, stole, I stole like 20 napkins. I like took an entire stack. Um, but so what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna read from is um, just this little excerpt about looking at the portraits. Um, For obvious reasons, it was the first ladies who were most memorable. When you initially walk in, Nancy Reagan greets you by the stairs. I think hers is the most glamorous portrait in the White House. Um, no matter what anyone says, footnote, other than Michelle Obama's obviously, but that wasn't when, there when I visited the White House in 2012. In a floor-length draping red dress with a multi-tiered pearl collar, she looks like an evil empress from Star Wars. <laughs> Have you seen this portrait? Like, Google it when you get home. It is everything. 
Um, and rightfully so. She and her husband would have hated what was happening under their roof. While they were in the White House, they did their very best to ensure that people like me simply died. Their inaction at the face of the 1980s AIDS epidemic was nothing short of genocidal. It's fitting that she'll spend posterity draped in red, the color of blood, a color that has become the symbol of the disease she and her husband let run wild. I relished that she had to gaze out as a 20-year-old queen like me strutted by in five-inch heels. I blew her a kiss as I passed. Then I walked into the Vermeil room, a first-floor room that is my favorite in the entire White House. When I entered, I found none other than Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis gazing obliquely back out at me. In a ruffled, high-collar, floor-length gown, she presided over the room in solemnity, in reverence, in what struck me almost as hesitation. It wasn't until I turned around that my breath was really taken away. On the far wall was none other than the bisexual-slash-lesbian human rights goddess herself, Eleanor Roosevelt. Sporty, can we get an applause for Eleanor Roosevelt? Please? <laughs> Sporting a fleur de lis brooch, a gray suit, and pearls, she rested one pink manicured hand on a book and cradled a yellow number two pencil in the other. A woman of words, sophistication, brilliance, and diplomatic power, Eleanor Roosevelt is the closest thing we've had to a woman president. I stared at her, a symbol of queer power and brilliance, of human rights and diplomacy, of women's authority and dominion. She looked back at me with a gentle, knowing glance, as if to say, you were meant to be here, as if to say, you belong here, as if to say, you should know your power. Just when I thought her portrait couldn't get any more fabulous, I took a look at the additional grayscale portraits of her sprinkled at the bottom of the frame. Again, look this up, you can't make it up. There's one of her laughing, head tilted to the side, kind of a... Um, and there's another one of her fiddling with her red wedding ring, interesting. And there's yet another of her thinking, chin perched in her hand, sort of a... <laughs> then, inexplicably, along the selfies are two pairs of hands floating in space. One pair of hands is holding a pair of glasses. The other is knitting. Can you imagine the conversation that must have led to that portrait? When Eleanor Roosevelt, a hipster meme icon, a way ahead of her time, must have looked to the portraitist and said, hey, I don't want them thinking I'm just a brilliant politician. Let's make sure they know I'm a nerdy lesbian slash bisexual, okay? <laughs> what could we include in the portrait to be sure they know? I don't know, maybe a pair of reading glasses? Sure, but it needs more. What about a cat? Two on the nose. What about some, um, knitting? Perfect, she must have exclaimed. Incredible. <laughs> and before I ask you both a question, I'll let you read your portrait, which is, um, puts, gives a nod to Mrs. Reagan as well, right? Oh, man. So, this is what we really have in common, is uh, we both have a, a bit of an uh, axe to grind with Nancy Reagan. <laughs> um, I mean, it's more Ronald, but like, you know, yeah. accessory right. to the um, So I'm going to keep it real quick and short, sweet. Um, where is... Okay, yeah. So um, this is just about... Um, Alex lives in the White House, um, one of the bedrooms. Um, so uh, his own room, let's see. Now straight across the hall, June's room is all bright white and soft pink and minty green, photographed by Vogue and famously inspired by old 60s interior design periodicals she found in one of the White House sitting rooms. His own room was once Caroline Kennedy's nursery and later, warranting some sage burning from June, Nancy Reagan's office. Uh, he left up the nature field illustrations in a neat symmetrical grid above the sofa, but painted over Sasha Obama's pink walls with a deep blue. Um, yeah, so that's, that's my Nancy Reagan <laughs> reference. I would say, Gotta though, um, you both did a great job of um, bringing queer representation to usually non-queer spaces. Um, was that intentional? And what do you think, as a community, we should do to elevate the queer representation in these non-queer spaces, like the White House? Well, well you know. Or museums or parks across the country? You know, what's interesting to me is like, it, it, you could, it's yes, like mainstream lens, not a queer space. But what I think I tried to do in my book was um, explain that like queer people have existed in these spaces forever and they were just invisible to us. Mm. Or they were invisible to like the straight narrative of what happened in history. But I put these, all of these like historical love letters, like they, I've got Eleanor Roosevelt's queer correspondence in this book, mm -hmm. you know? And I've got um, like historical love letters between queer people dating back into like, you know, like the 1600s. Um, in this book, and, and I think that's what I'm trying to get at, and like one of the themes of the book is like queerness happening in plain sight on the world stage in the biggest, like most historic, most famous places in the world having never been acknowledged until now in this, you know. And I think that's kind of, it, it's not even necessarily about taking a space that's never been queer and making it queer, it's about taking a space that's always had a tinge of queerness in it and being like, you cannot 
ignore this, right. you know? And Jacob, I remember with your interview with Jonathan Capehart, he remembers you when you came into the White House that mm -hmm. during that um, um, experience that you were talking about in the book, and it clearly made a, a mark. Well, it's, I mean, it's funny because uh, the thing I love about how our movement works and what the internet has done with it um, is that I'm already like a non-binary grandmother um, like truly, like I, I can like sit down with like, you know, 18 year olds and be like, children, <laughs> gather around. Um, I have a story for you. It's about how there was a period of time where genderqueer was a more popular and universal term than non-binary. Did you know? And then they duked it out in around 2014, 2015, 2016, and the one I chose lost. <laughs> and now I use non-binary because I am not a computer, Mr. Zuckerberg. Um, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like I, I have all this sort of like generational knowledge already, which is incredible. I mean, what a gift. Um, and, and part of that generational knowledge is that like in 2012, when I went to that, when I went to the White House Pride reception, like there were very, very few visibly gender non-conforming people there. Um, because we, that like sort of like that, that major wave of kind of trans and gen GNC representation hadn't really crested fully yet. Um, and, and, I, and I went back, like uh, I went to the, was it 2017 or something? Yeah, I think it was 27, no, 2016. I went back again and like it was visibly more trans and more queer and like had more women and like was, was a better intersection of our community. And I think it just shows like how quickly we're, we're shifting all of that. Um, but yeah, when I was there in high heels, I think I was the, uh, I was, I didn't see like a lot of other like visibly gender nonconforming people in the space, except for this one sweet baby named Slow, who um, I, uh, he was wearing a kilt um, and we immediately became friends. Um, and I had a little bit of a crush on him. Um, and I totally forgot meeting him after that. And then I met him in New York again, because apparently, like, because he, like, works with one of the, like, biggest queer and trans foundations. Um, and I was like, wait, where do we know each other from? And he was like, were you wearing heels in the White House? And I was like, <laughs> that is the most glamorous sentence. Can you say it again? <laughs> and I was like, me? I guess I was. Um, but all that is to say, like, that doesn't even feel like, it doesn't feel like a big deal anymore in a way that I'm really into, right? Like, I don't want to be that scary trans person in high heels in the White House. I want to be like that scary prison abolitionist and slash socialist in the White House, you know what I mean? Like who happens to be wearing heels. Um, that's my dream. So we're gonna start taking questions from the audience. There's a microphone over there. We'll need you to go over there. So while you guys are lining up, I'll ask a couple more questions. Please come, we want to hear from you. Um, I need to ask you this, Casey. So um, when I was reading this book, it's when the whole um, Meghan Merkel and Prince Harry thing was unfolding, how they were separating themselves from the White House. Where do you see, Hen do you think this, what happened with them would happen the same with Henry and Alex in, in your universe? Okay, uh, right off the bat, I just wanna say Team Megan for life. Um, I love her and also think that like the royal family owes her an enormous debt of gratitude for making them relevant again. Um, because like they were real dusty and she came in and she made them cool. Um, but, so here's the thing is, I'm like, the one, like, okay, I support them and everything they've done and the one thing that bugs me about it is that I literally had it in my outlines in Google Docs of like what I think would happen next in Henry and Alex's world, like, like a year ago and now it's gonna seem ripped from the headlines and I swear to God it's not. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, I think that like, that's absolutely how I envision a future for them is, is um, I would see like Alex wanting to run for office one day and, and, um, and then wanting to kind of step away from the, I mean, Henry doesn't want, he never wanted to be a prince. He is not into it. He does not enjoy it. It is not a fun time for him. Um, and so I think that he would be like, yeah, whatever. I mean, we can live in America, I don't care. You know, <laughs> like, I think he's chill with that. Perfect. Well, take our first question. Uh, hi, I'm Isabel. I use they, them pronouns. <laughs> I actually work at a bookstore um, in DC, Kramer Books, uh, which I was I just there you. today. Hey. hey. Yes, I met you specifically, uh, Jacob, when mm -hmm. you came in to sign a copy of your book, and it sold almost immediately. Um, and I've been talking this, uh, this this up to everyone who's come in and mentioned uh, anything about queerness in the last week, mm -hmm. which has been fun for me. Um, uh, but. Um, so last week was Aero Spec Awareness Week, uh, A Romantic mm -hmm. Spectrum Awareness Week. Um, I'm Aero, and it, one of the things that I enjoy doing is reading, uh, reading aromanticism into characters or into mm -hmm. people. 
Um, I definitely see Nora as a romantic, and can that be like, is that a legit headcanon or? I endorse this. Okay. Whoa. Thanks. Have fun with that Twitter. <laughs> Do you plan on writing a sequel, Casey? I can't. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Casey cannot disclose this information <laughs> at this time. I'm sorry, do you guys hear some like feedback on the mic? I just can't hear anything right now. I just heard this faint whisper of a voice ask you a question, but was it materially happening in our yeah. astral plane? That's the weirdest thing that's happened. I don't know. Happened. Wow. Anyway. <laughs> Hello, I'm Sam. I use she, her pronouns. I'm dying of happiness right now. Um, so, I, Jacob, I'm glad that you brought up American Dirt because a question I had for Casey was that, uh, and part, like, excuse me if I'm wrong, but you are a white author and you wrote, like, and I'm also a white person, and I, you wrote what I've, like, heard and seen and, you know, like, from, like, my Latinx friends and stuff to be, like, a really believable character of color and a mixed race character, and Alex, like, really uh, identifies with that and wrestles with that throughout the book. Can you talk a little bit about essentially like what you undertook as an author to write a believable character of color. Yeah, I mean, um, the biggest thing I think um, is just doing your research. Um, I think that uh, when you're not writing uh, specifically inside your lane, um, it's, you have to be really intentional about like, are you doing an identity story about that identity? And if so, perhaps you are not the right person to do that. Mm -hmm. But um, Alex is, like, this book is not really, like, a book about being, like, a biracial Mexican-American person at, like, it's, like, like, you know, that's not, like, it's thesis, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's more about being queer and how that, like, is enveloped in all of these other things. Um, and so, uh, but so with this, it was, it was all about, like, I mean, talking to my friends who are Latinx and, um, and having a sensitivity reader and doing a lot of research and also just drawing, I mean, he's very much drawn from like, I'm, I'm from like Louisiana next door to Texas. Uh, he's like inspired by so many people that I knew and my friends knew growing up um, that were around in my, like in like the orbit of my life. Um, it just seemed really natural as soon as I knew his mom was like a Texas Democrat. I was like, okay, this is what's happening. Um, but yeah, I think it was, uh, I just tried really, really, really hard to, um, more than anything, my goal was like, I never wanted any reader who was like, uh, like a Mexican American person to come away from this book feeling anything less than like, hell yeah, you know? Yeah. And, and that's like the biggest thing at the end of the day is like, what is like, are you gonna do harm? Are you gonna, how are you gonna make a reader feel? You know, more than like, what is this, how is this gonna play on like, you know, online or whatever? Um, it's just like care in like a personal level, you know, so. Can I piggyback off of that? And we were talking about this yeah. backstage, that both of you are from the South. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. tend, it feels like, especially in the narrative, um, many Southern progressives, um, you brought it up, uh, the, the, the girls that you grew up with and their families, yeah. and you coming from, you know, Louisiana, I feel like the progressives in these states tend to get lost in the shuffle. Mm -hmm. Was that intention for, intentional for both of you to elevate that? Mm. Um, yeah, it was a really intentional decision to start to, to, to start my book in North Carolina when I was born um, and then like end it at college graduation in North Carolina. Partially because I was like, I'm trying to set up some narrative tension for what happens next. Um, but mostly it was because as a queer southerner, um, I spend so much time in, in New York and in Los Angeles where I live now um, living under this really false assumption that makes me so so grumpy, um, where people take one look at me and they're like, where'd you grow up? And I'm like, I grew up in North Carolina. And they're like, I totally know why you moved out here. That's, I get why you came to LA. It must be so much better for you. I'm so glad you're here. And I'm like, okay, A, Raleigh's the shit. B, Durham is queerer than Los Angeles. Like, don't get it twisted. Um, and, and like, and C, like, you don't know my life. And D, like, it's not, I didn't escape the South. Like, if, if we didn't have such a mercantile economy where representations of queer and trans people and Southern people were not, like, don't, don't have to be centralized through Los Angeles or New York, like, I would stay in Raleigh. If I could sell a TV show in Raleigh, I'd stay in Raleigh. If it was easier, like, super easy to sell a book in Raleigh, I would, sell, I would stay in Raleigh, but I just moved for my job. You know what I mean? And I just get so grumpy that people think I moved from this persecution. And that's why I love that, like, that's why I made the choice for my book to start and end in North Carolina is because I learned everything I needed to know about myself in North Carolina. 
Um, and it's and the only chap right. And the only part of the book that doesn't take place in North Carolina, uh, other than the little DC bit, is this part where I did three three months in New York. And what it really is is an indictment of of the media industry because I did the same exact organizing shit I'd always been doing in North Carolina, nothing different, just got up to some hijinks and started talking about some stuff, did this fundraiser run for the Ali Fournay Center, which is a shelter for homeless LGBTQ youth um, in New York City. They were flooded in Hurricane Sandy, um, did a fundraiser for them where I ran across the Brooklyn Bridge in high heels. But again, same shenanigans as I was doing in North Carolina. And I went from like, you know, this like nobody activist in North Carolina who no media had ever cared about my work to like literally on MSNBC opposite Thomas Rob talking on national news about my run and New Yorker of the week, like from New York One, like the station for like 7 million people, right? And so like all oh, what it taught me was, oh yeah, you don't give a shit about what, how my consciousization and politics are formed in the South. You only care about them when I make them relevant to New York or Los Angeles. Shame on you. Yeah. And you, Casey, you made sure um, the first family was from Texas. You could have easily wrote that they were from New York or from California. Yeah, and I think they're, like, when I first started coming up with this concept, I think that, like, my first thought was, okay, like, what's the blueprint for what a first female president would look like, you know, in 2016? And I was like, okay, so she's, like, uh, from Cape Cod, and, like, blah, blah, blah. And, and then I was like, that is so boring to me as somebody from the South. Um, when I was writing this, I was still living in Louisiana. Um, and, and what really interested me was um, Wendy Davis, uh, the poly... Texas state senator, um, I like watched her filibuster uh, for reproductive rights um, in 2013 with like tears streaming down my face, and you know, and to me like just like the the memory of like her talking about like abortion rights in like that Texas drawl with her big blonde hair mm. was like the best thing ever, mm. and and I just like I wanted that to be my president in this book, um, and so uh, and that was kind of where because. I have this chip on my shoulder because, I mean, people write off Texas. They like Texas. People like act like Texas is the most backward state in the country when Houston is in Texas, and Houston is mathematically, statistically, the most diverse city in the country. And that's not just my feelings. That is literally math, you know. And um, Houston gave us Beyonce. And Houston gave us Beyonce. <laughs> yes. Texas gave us Meg The Stallion. Okay. Um, I mean, okay, but um, <laughs> sorry, tangent. Um, but yeah, like it's it's such a chip on my shoulder that I feel like um, like people don't like like progressive people um, in blue states just tend to write off red states as a monolith, and they don't consider the fact that like how heavily gerrymandered they are, how mm. many voters are disenfranchised mm. in these states, and and how many people like yeah like the, the, it's not that the people in these states don't care or don't exist or are all like backwards and and, and conservative and hateful. It's that a lot of these people like can't vote or can't get off work to vote or, or you know, like things like that. And that is why these things are like, that's why these th states are so deeply red. And that's just something, I mean, Alex literally goes on a rant about this in, in the book. There's a whole subplot in my romance novel about gerrymandering. <laughs> I'm sorry, you know? <laughs> But yeah, it is, it is the chip on my shoulder. Um, I actually, progressive people from the South are my favorite people in the world. Um, like, best, yes, best ever. We got some excitement in the audience and I felt yeah. it. <laughs> Sorry to sideline it, our next question. Hi, I'm Hannah. I consider myself a pronoun anarchist, um, <laughs> which is a thing I stole from my queer theory professor. Yes. On queer theory though, you mentioned briefly, Jacob, um, the queer theory classes in college. I was just wondering, if like queer theory at all played into your writing of this book, or if you thought about it at all, and if so, like which aspects of queer theory? Um, yeah, I mean, I, this book in so many ways for me um, is a big ol' fuck you to the academy. Um, because I feel like I, I did a lot of, I took a lot of queer theory courses in college, and like, uh, not a lot, but like some. And, um, and I really enjoyed the texts I was reading, right? Like, but deciphering them took so much work. Um, and I think that there's this way in which the Academy has uh, co-opted and actually silenced queer thought by putting all the queer academic, like, by saying basically, like, if you're a queer person, one of the only places you can have, like, an even sort of, and I put big asterisks around, even sort of stable career is, like, in the Academy, right? So you get all, you sort of siphon all these brilliant queer minds into the Academy, then you make them do this evil hunger games to see who can be least accessible, right? Like, who can be the most jargony and the most wordy and all this other kind of stuff. And then, um, and then make sure to shun them super hard if they do any culturally accessible work at all and ensure that they don't have job prospects if they're accessible one little bit. 
Um, so there's an economic model uh, that disincentivizes the, some of the most brilliant queer theorists and queer thinkers in our times and trans thinkers from being accessible to everybody. And so I really wanted to write a book because like, the thing is, being non-binary is not complicated. It's not indecipherable. It's, it's, it's effortlessly easy. Um, not the lived experience, but the idea of it, right? The idea of the gender spectrum is super easy for anyone to understand. Literally, like, old grandmas who have no experience with any of this can understand all of this when I explain it to them within, like, five minutes. It's not even, like, an hour-long lecture. Um, and so accessibility was my number one, um, and I really was committed to that. And it's interesting because I do feel in some ways I've paid a price for that. Um, I think that there's a lot of literary folks who don't consider my book to be legitimate because I wanted it to be accessible to my neighbors in North Carolina as much as I wanted it to be funny, as much as I wanted it to be um, you know, in insightful in some sorts of ways. So, so I, I guess what I'll say is I have a deep appreciation for queer and fo trans folks in the academy doing such important labor, but I am not okay with the academy, the economics of it, and the way that it prioritizes making queer and trans knowledges inaccessible to queer and trans people and to everybody else, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Like, we I'm are, never gonna get a PhD unless it's given honorary. We are running out a little bit of a time, so we're gonna fly through all your questions here. Hi, my name is Megan, I use she, her pronouns, and one of the ways I was pitching Red, White, and Royal Blue to all of my friends was saying that it read like a really good fan fiction, um, so I was, uh, <laughs> I was wondering, uh, I view fan fiction as like kind of inherently queer, queer rom-coms are fan fiction in my opinion, um, so I was wondering if any, either of you, both of you have experience with fan fiction as a way to hone your craft, as a queer space, as a delegitimized form of writing? Oh my god. I think, um, oh my god, I think that's like, I think that is, um, it's, is that like the original, like, I think about these Star Trek zines of mm -hmm. like, Kirk and Spock <laughs> from like the 70s that people were mailing out as like one of the first like indie queer zines mm -hmm. <laughs> that were happening. I mean, that's pretty cool, right? Historically yeah. speaking. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what I'll say is that um, my middle school sexuality I uh, was more deeply marinated in Smallville fan fiction <laughs> than I would like to publicly fully get into. Um, it is also where I realized I think I'm into um, uh, uh, this kink thing because Kryptonite <laughs> plays a role in all of these fanfics that is really getting to me on some level. Um, and I will also say uh, that I spent way too many evenings um, reading the Harry Potter fanfic that my best friend Paige uh, was writing for, for me to read, and she would do readings, and we'd both sit there and be like, I really wish that we were attracted to each other so that we could read this and get in a frenzy and then make out a bunch, but we're just gonna hold this sexual frustration together in solidarity. When I was like looking back on my adolescence at like the early signs that I very willfully ignored of queerness, I had I like recovered this memory of being 12 years old and seeking out Hermione and Ginny uh, <laughs> fan fiction uh, on fanfiction.net. Like it was very steamy. It was like in the Gryffindor common room, um, and you know, uh, and I was like, hmm, seems straight. Like at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so. I, a heterosexual, <laughs> reading <laughs> Hermione and Jenny. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I live for you. We'll take the next question. I was like, can we talk about the hair that has come through so this So many incredible line? hair colors. I'm very proud of all of you. Haircuts, hair colors, everything. Amazing. Um, hi, I'm Marie. My pronouns are they, them, or she, her. And I just wanted to ask you, at the beginning of, of this session... <clears throat> The moderator said something that caused me to grip my teeth, and I just wanted to know how you felt about it, Jacob and Casey. How do you feel when people address you as guys? Mm -hmm. First of all, I want to apologize if that mm -hmm. uh, bothered anyone here. So it was not my intention. Yeah, and, and I think we can have this as like a community organizing moment for a minute and do like an oops, ouch. Do you all know that principle of community organizing where we like name things that hurt you, we say ouch, we like hold space for the fact that it did, um, but we also are able to like do that as a learning thing as a community rather than as like a stigmatizing the person who did it. So thank you for oops, ouching and for making this a community organizing space. I'm so happy you did. Um, can we get a round of applause for that? Thank you. Um, and you know, Secondly, I, I struggle with this one because it's like, 
I feel like there's this entire Generation Z that is like literally grown up on, hey you guys, blah, 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 subscribe to my channel. You know what I mean? Like that's the formula of like their brains. And so I'm kind of like, do historic, like is this the linguistic battle that I would like to fight? Um, and, and I only say that because like, I, I, I get so exhausted, as I'm sure you do as well, fighting language. Um, because language is not hard to change. Language changes all the time to accommodate people. We add words to the dictionary every day. Well, at least once a year. Um, <laughs> uh, like, and, and the idea that it is so difficult for people to shift. Like, when I tell people I use they, them pronouns, they'll just be like, oh, whoa, it's me, I must address you with this unfamiliar language, you know? Like, they like give a whole performance. And I'm just like, girl, A, it's not that dramatic. And B, um, like, are you, is it really that difficult to, like, try? You know what I mean? Um, that being said, I have decided, just for my own emotional well-being, and because I think it's, I think it is, it's what I've learned from, like, Leslie Feinberg. Um, who, do y'all know who Leslie Feinberg is? Stone go, Witch, please. Yeah, go read some Leslie Feinberg. Like, go, go right, like, when you're done. Um, uh, and I, I feel like what I learned from Leslie Feinberg, because, because they write about this a lot, he writes about this a lot, she writes about this a lot, um, that, is that, like, when with pronouns, with language in general, it's so important to try to hear people's intention even when it hurts us because it's a way of navigating the world with more honesty and emotional truth, right? So when someone uses the wrong pronouns for me, which happens like unprofessional context all the time um, for me, it happens daily, it happens all the time, I try to hear their intention as much as I hear what they said because it is a way to make it more easy for me to navigate the world. It's not about them. It's not about forgiving them or absolving them of responsibility. It's about me being able to feel happy in my day-to-day -day life and I think it's okay to hold that people don't often mean what we feel and that these transitions are gonna be really gradual, um, but we're gonna get there in terms of having more gender neutral language and having more inclusive language for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, echoing all of that, obviously, um, I think this is what's great about the South is that we have y'all. <laughs> y'all is gender neutral, everyone. <laughs> Uh, and I highly encourage you to uh, invite y'all into your life. Um, but it is exactly what you're saying. I think um, it's, it's like this, this, this we're all um, trying to grapple with our own pronouns every day. Um, and also just moving through life with the best of intentions and in queer spaces and um, inevitably screwing that up. Right. You know, um, and, and yeah. It, for me, it's also about having an intergenerational perspective because I know that I'm going to be 47 and on a stage and I am not going to be able to keep up with what these youngins are talking about anymore. <laughs> and I was like, well, back in my day, we just had they, them, blah, 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 or we just had, it was just non-binary and trans, like 14 other gender identities, but there were only 15. And now they're going to be like, well, there are 37 shades and you have to memorize all of them. And I'll be like, I am sorry, I am trying. And so I, I try to be really like super just like, flowy with that stuff in, in, out of self-interest again. Is there a way we could have both of you ask your question right after each other? So, um, because we're running a little close on time here. We'll let you ask your question, I'll let him ask his question. Hi, uh, so Jacob, I know from your Instagram that you kind of have a beef with Queer Eye, um, just mm -hmm. like really subtly. Um, and you mentioned the commodification of queer narratives a little bit earlier, so mm -hmm. I was wondering if um, you or if both of you um, have more thoughts on that you'd like to share. Um, my question is related to media as well. Uh, both of you have, uh, you know, media adaptations of your work in the works, and I was just wondering uh, what your reaction to getting that offer was like. Hmm. Um, well, so, I mean, sort of digging into the, the kind of queer eye of it all, I mean, first of all, let me say I, like, individually stand for, 